Hopefully everyone has gotten a, uh, a paper with the chapter of the confession that we're looking at this evening. If you haven't gotten one yet, uh, I think there are still some out in the hallway. Uh, so feel free to jump up and grab one of those. So again, this evening we are in chapter four of the confession. We've come now to the doctrine of creation. So chapter four is entitled, Of Creation. I think we would all agree, uh, I think it's probably safe to assume that we would all agree that the doctrine of cre creation is one of the most foundational doctrines of the Christian faith. If, if we fail to see, if we, if we either fail to see or on the other hand, if we fail to believe what has been clearly revealed to us uh, with regard to creation, if we fail to see and believe that we are creatures and that we have been uh, made and we owe our existence to a creator, then we are missing the very foundation of what it means to be human. So if we miss God as our creator, then nothing else in life and nothing else in this world makes sense. I'm sure you've heard of people talk about worldview and the various worldviews that there are. The Christian worldview is that there is a creator and that he has complete and sovereign right over his creatures and that he is in perfect and sovereign control over all things. That is foundational to what it is to be a Christian. We are not here on the earth. We don't exist as, as random bundle, bundles or random uh, collection of molecules and matter that, that just happens to exist. That's, that's not how we got here. If that were the case, then life would be meaningless. We would be meaningless. But we, we got here because a sovereign God made us. He designed us the exact way that he purposed to make us. He fashioned us in our mother's womb, and he placed us here on this earth. The doctrine of God as creator is what gives meaning to our existence, and it gives meaning to everything else we see and experience. Apart from this doctrine, everything crumbles. Its fabric comes undone. And so the doctrine of creation then, God as creator, is foundational. The chapter, if you look on your, uh, your document there, the chapter is broken up into three paragraphs, and I've given three different headings to those paragraphs. The first paragraph deals with the creation of the world. The second paragraph deals with the creation of man in particular. And then the third paragraph deals with the command that was given to man at creation. So the creation of the world in general, the creation of man in particular, and then even more specifically, the command that was given to man at creation. So we'll start with that first paragraph, considering the doctrine of the creation of the world. The confession reads, in the beginning, it pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in order to demonstrate the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness, to create or make the world and all things in it, whether visible or invisible, in a period of six days, and all very good. So if you notice there, the subheadings, we've broken that paragraph up into six different subheadings. We'll walk through each of those and see where they come from, from the scriptures. Again, the goal is not just to know what the confession says, but the confession is intended to point us to the scriptures, which is our authority. And so we want to see are these things really found in the Bible? So first, the time of creation. The time of creation. When did creation happen? They're under point A, in the beginning. Obviously, those come from the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the very first words of the Bible, then, are teaching us something very basic to, with regard to the distinction between creator and creation. It's reminding us that there is an infinite distinction, an infinite distance between the God who is eternal and everything else. There is one creator and everything else that exists is created. There are only two categories of existence. Creation has a beginning. There was when creation was not. There was not when God was not. There was never a time, you can't even speak of it in terms of time, there never was when God was not. He is eternal. He is self-existent. He depends on nothing outside of himself. Nothing outside of himself gives him his being, and nothing outside of himself transforms his being. He is the eternally self-existent God. 
That can't be said of creation. Creation depends entirely upon its creator. And so the very first words of the Bible remind us there is an infinite distinction between the being of God and our being as creatures. And then secondly, well, let, me, let me just quote Psalm 90 verse 2 as a scripture reference there. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before there was anything, there was God. And then secondly, the creator is the triune God. So let her be there. The creator is the triune God. So often I think when we think of creation, at least speaking for myself, I would tend to attribute creation primarily to the work of the Father, God the Father as creator. But if we look at the scriptures, all three persons are involved in creation. Here are just a couple references to show the involvement of each person of the Trinity in the work of creation. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, we read, There is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. All things are from the Father as creator. And then John, the first couple of verses of his gospel, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Speaking of Christ, so now the Son's involvement in creation. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, that is, through Christ, the Son, the Word. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So the Father created, according to 1 Corinthians 8. The Son created, according to John 1, verses 1 to 2. Nothing came into being except that which has come into being through Christ. And then thirdly, the Holy Spirit is involved in creation. Just curious, could anyone throw out a verse that would suggest that the Holy Spirit is involved in creation? Exactly, yeah. Genesis 1, verse 2. The Spirit hovering over creation. So it says in Genesis 1, verse 2, The earth was formless and void... And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And then it says, And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And that verb, moving, it implies more than just motion. It's intentional motion. It's, he's, he's doing something. He is ordering things. And so most people understand that the Spirit's, uh, most people understand the Spirit's involvement in creation to be that of bringing to order that which God has made. And so God formed the the expanse, and then the Holy Spirit brought it into order as he hovered over it. So the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all are creator, all three persons, which is why, most likely, in Genesis 1.26, God does not say, I am going to make man in my image according to my likeness. God says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Most likely what's going on there is a reference to the three persons of the Trinity creating man in the image of God. And so we, we saw a couple weeks ago, uh, a few, several weeks ago now, when we were studying the chapter on God, his being and his attributes and his triune nature, we saw that we would have no redemption apart from the three persons of the Trinity. We need the love of the Father and his work in redemption, uh, his planning it and purposing it. We need the Son's work in redemption and uh, accomplishing it, and we need the Holy Spirit's work in redemption and applying the benefits of it to our soul. And so we saw that in our relationship to God as Savior, we must relate to him in, with regard to the role that each particular person of the Trinity plays. Our relationship with God is Trinitarian. Well, in the same way, when we think about worshiping God as creator, we don't just worship him as Father creator. We worship God as the triune creator, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We don't just sing that to the Father. We sing it to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All three are he from whom all blessings flow, and we praise him and we worship him for that. And then thirdly, let us see the purpose of creation. So again, still speaking of creation in general, all things that have been made. What is the purpose of everything that's been made? To demonstrate God's glory. Probably the clearest verses on this that demonstrate God's purpose in creation being to display his glory would be Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2. We read, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. The heavens tell of his glory, 
Their expanse declares the work of his hands. They are proclaiming there is a glorious maker, a glorious creator behind all that has been made. I think in some ways uh, our fast, fast-paced lifestyle in the 21st century West has, uh, at least using that as an excuse, it has caused us in some ways to lose the art of slowing down and reflecting on God's glory as it's revealed in creation. Taking time to reflect on what God has made and allow it to stir our hearts to worship. I would say many of us, uh, probably the majority of us, don't intentionally set apart time to stop and think and reflect on what God has made and worship him. But that hasn't been the case for much, really most of church history. If you look back at many of the old hymns that were written, poems that were written, books that were written, so many of them worship God in very uh, thoughtful ways for what he has made. For example, Isaac Watts' hymn written in 1715, I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. So he sings the power of God. And then I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. So there's wisdom. And I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed wherever I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. John Newton, sorry, Isaac Watts is saying, everywhere I look, I see the power, the wisdom, and the goodness of God. And he's taking time to reflect on that. And I wonder if we do that. How often do your prayers reflect gratitude and worship to God as creator for the things that he's made? It would be a good thing to build into your times of prayer. Taking time to slow down and reflect or go outside and reflect on the things that God has made. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. That's his purpose in creation. And then fourthly, the scope of creation. What does God's creation involve? What all is included in his creation? All things visible and invisible. Uh, So Colossians 1, verse 16, for by him, this is speaking specifically of Christ, the Son, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. All things have been created through the Son, whether visible or invisible. So just a reminder, there is an entire unseen realm that you and I have never set our eyes on that displays the glory of God. We, we, we see this side of creation. We see what is seen, what, what we can see. There's an entire realm of existence that is declaring God's glory that you and I have never even set our eyes on. Then there's the span of creation, letter E, six days. So it took God six days to create the world. That's obviously the teaching of Genesis 1. God created all things. There was evening and there was morning. There was morning and there was evening. Uh, Six days God created. The seventh day he rested. That's not just the teaching in Genesis. We see that repeated throughout the scriptures, this understanding that the, the creation of the world happened in a literal six-day period. Uh, we see it in Genesis, sorry, Exodus 31. So most of these scripture references are on the paper, uh, if you haven't noticed. But Exodus 31, verses 16 to 17, uh, God is teaching his people with regard to the Sabbath. And the whole basis of the Sabbath, as we were reminded Sunday, the whole basis of the Sabbath is the fact that six days we work because six days God worked. And this is what it says in Exodus chapter 31. So the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. But on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed. So six days God made heaven and the earth. And the most natural way to read that, I think the way we need to read it, not only in light of these passages, but in the rest of the scripture's teaching and its perspective on the first 11 chapters of Genesis, uh, we need to read it as a literal six-day creation. Of course, there's a lot of controversy surrounding that. And uh, perhaps this is the area, one of the, the primary areas in which Christians are ridiculed today. 
were believing that the world was created in six days in the time that the Bible uh, says that it was created, the number of years since it has been created. And, uh, and obviously that can be disconcerting, can be difficult at times. We don't have all the answers. We come back to God's word. We always rest in the authority of God's word. Wherever science is right, we'll one day see how science fits perfectly into the revelation of God. Wherever science is wrong, we'll one day see how the revelation of God was always right. But obviously we, we should think about these things and try to consider how should we interpret the scriptures? How can we respond to people who raise the sorts of questions uh, like the ones that are raised against creation with regard to the age of the earth and the time span of its creation? I think one way to approach it, uh, as Sam Waldron helpfully points out, is to recognize that it's not entirely unlikely that God created the earth with the appearance of older age. So if you, if you think about uh, two examples in the Bible that demonstrate that God is very capable of creating something brand new, but that has the appearance of something that's not brand new, that's old. Can anyone think of two examples? Adam and Eve? Yeah, that's a good one. So how old was Adam on the first day of creation? It was the first day. So he was one day. He was a matter of hours old. Was Adam six pounds, three ounces, bald and crying? No, he was a grown man, at least as far as we can understand it in the scriptures. He seems to be a grown man. He was only moments old and yet had the appearance of a grown man. Another example, anyone else know another example? John chapter 2, Jesus turning water to the wine. So listen to what Sam Waldron writes about this. I I thought it was helpful. I'm going to quote him. He says, a scientist, and even a non-scientist, especially a wine expert of the day, no doubt would have found in this wine plenty of things to indicate an age far in excess of 10 minutes. The wine expert might have even been able to specify what vineyards and varieties of grapes had provided the historical background of this good wine. And yet, the wine was only moments old. And so is it possible then that God created the world with the appearance of age? Absolutely, of course. Is it possible that science cannot quite fully grasp the wisdom and the magnitude of God? Quite possible. In fact, it's guaranteed. And so we can come back to the scriptures and recognize, yeah, we may not understand it all. We may not understand how it all comes together. But we can, if we're going to lean on one or the other, we lean on the solid foundation of God's word, not science. Not to say that science is not extremely helpful, but it's not our ultimate authority. So the Bible's teaching then is that God created the world in the span of six literal days. Next, the state of creation was very good. Letter F. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 68 says, You are good and you do good. God is good in his essence and therefore everything God does is good because it's an expression of his essence. And so therefore, because God is good and because all that God is, uh, that all God does is good, His creation is good. He cannot create something that is bad. So what that means is that all that we see and all that we enjoy as it's been created by God is good. Things like food and work and nature and leisure and relationships and homes and exercise. These are good things and as good things they're meant to be enjoyed by uh, by recognizing that they're gifts from God. So 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 3 to 4, Timothy says... Men who forbid marriage, he's talking about this false doctrine that's crept into the church, and this is how he describes this. In fact, he calls it demonic doctrine. This is demonic doctrine. These men forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. God's creation is good, all that he has made, and so we should... Be careful not to draw too much of a distinction between what is spiritual and what is material. Or give all the weight of value and worth to what is spiritual to the exclusion of what is physical. According to the scriptures, what is material is intended to be enjoyed as a means of worship. And so we don't reject material enjoyment. We use material enjoyment as an opportunity to worship and express gratitude to God. All right, so that's the first paragraph on the creation of the world. Second, more specifically, second paragraph dealing with the creation of man. So, 
the confession reads, after God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with rational and immortal souls, making them suitable for that life to God for which they were created. They were made in the image of God, in knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. They had the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it. At the same time, they had a possibility of transgressing that law, being left to the freedom of their own will, which was subject to change. So the first point then is that man is created male and female. That's obvious from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So woven into the fabric of the DNA of every individual is either male or female. There isn't a wide range of possible genders between the two. God created only two, and those two perfectly complement one another as image bearers of God. And then secondly, he created man as soul and body. Soul and body. So he's given us everything we need in order to relate to God and carry out the life that he's given us, which involves both soul and body. A number of passages point out that we as human beings are both soul and body. Matthew 10, verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We are body and we are soul. The body can be destroyed in hell. The soul is undying. Uh, we know that the body won't ultimately be destroyed if we're believers, which we'll see in uh, just a little bit, I think. Um, well, in just a moment, I guess I'll reference that. But the body can be destroyed temporarily. The soul cannot. It's undying. And so we are both body and soul. But again, we shouldn't draw too much of a distinction between our body and our soul. So the Bible never encourages a dualistic outlook on things. It never says or suggests that the material is pitted against the spiritual, that the material is evil, that the spiritual is good, that uh, you know, we should intentionally try to harm ourselves physically as an expression of spirituality. That is never the case in the Bible. Both spiritual and physical are um, intricate parts of who we are, inherent parts of who we are, and we are not whole either apart from the body or apart from the soul. So we are not complete without our soul. We are not complete without our body. If you want to read an interesting passage on that, you should look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We don't have time to get into it this evening, but Paul is talking about his desire to not fall asleep and have his body separated from his soul. He would much rather Christ return while he's still alive so that his body is not separated from his soul. Interesting point. Uh, because the same Paul that says he would, I'm getting way off course, same Paul who says he would rather go and be with Jesus than remain on the earth in Philippians 1, and yet here he's saying, but I really would rather Christ return because I don't, it's not good for body and soul to be separated, to be unclothed is the way he puts it. So anyway, interesting, interesting thoughts from Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You can take a look there. So we shouldn't be uh, we, sh we should be careful not to make too much of a distinction between soul and body. They're both a very important part of who we are. And this is why Jesus didn't come only to redeem our souls, did he? Jesus didn't come just to save your soul. He came to save your soul, but he also came to save your body. He is the redeemer of your body, not just your soul. The full enjoyment of God throughout all of eternity will depend upon having not just an, a disembodied soul, the full enjoyment of God, the full expression of worship, full delight in him depends on us having both body and soul. That's how he's made us as human beings. In some mystery, they are temporarily separated during the intermediate state after we die, waiting Christ's return. But that's not how it's supposed to be. And so we should recognize the goodness of all that we are, the whole person, both body and soul. And that should affect the way that we minister to others as well or seek to care for others as well. We should care not just for people spiritually. Obviously, the eternal state of their soul is most important. That will determine their eternal destiny. But that's not to the exclusion of caring for their whole person, which involves their physical being as well. And so caring for others involves spiritual concern and material concern as well. And then second, uh, thirdly, under the second paragraph, letter C, we are created to be the image of God. 
So we're created to be the image of God. We see that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's another word that is used in the scriptures that's synonymous with image. They're used interchangeably, and that's likeness. So you have image, and then Genesis 5 uses likeness in the exact same way. There are other places in the scriptures where image and likeness are used interchangeably. And the idea of image or the idea of likeness is simply that we are a replica, a a visible representation of God. That's what it is to be the image of God. You are a visible replica or representation of God on the earth. It's interesting to note that the words image and likeness are the same words that are used when God condemns idolatry. So he tells us that we are not to make anything in his likeness or in the likeness of anything in the heavens. And he tells us And he condemns repeatedly, especially in the Psalms and the prophets, the idolatrous making of images as objects of worship, as as objects that are intended to reflect something divine. Whether it's likeness of God, images that are made in his likeness, God condemns all of it. He detests it. And why does God detest man making something in his image? Because God has already made something in his image. And it is a living representation of him. And so when we create something and fashion something in the image of God, basically what we're saying is we are abdicating our role. We would rather not be images of God. We would rather make for ourselves these images over here. But God has called us uniquely as human beings to represent him as image bearers, to display his character and his glory. So what is it to be the image of God It is everything about you that enables you to reflect something of the character of God. To be the image of God or to be created in the likeness of God means that everything about you in some way is intended to reflect the character of God. This includes everything physical and everything spiritual. It includes everything emotional and everything intellectual. Everything about you is intended to represent the being and the character of God. Obviously, when God created Adam and Eve, they were good images and accurate images. What about after Adam and Eve sinned? Is mankind today still the image of God, or have they fallen from that image? According to multiple references in the Bible, after the fall, man continues to be the image of God. James 3, verse 9, it says... With our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. With our mouths we curse men, and when we do that, we are cursing someone who has been fashioned and formed today in the image of God. So even after the fall, we continue to be reflections and representations of the likeness of God. It's helpful to remember that the image of God is not something we possess. You hear me? See if you can make the connection. The image of God is not something you possess. The image of God is something you are. So you can lose something that you possess. You can't lose something that you are. The image of God has been radically distorted in mankind. It's been radically corrupted. We are poor reflections of God because of our sin. But that doesn't change the fact that we are his image bearers. A number, uh, maybe like two years ago, three years ago or so, well, four years ago, we moved into our house. And in our front yard, the year we moved into our house, was a beautiful maple tree, uh, big and strong and healthy and full of leaves in the summer. And it cast perfect shade over the front of our house, uh, especially into our upper uh, playroom area that has a big window on the front and it kept it nice and cool. It was a wonderful tree. A maple tree. But one year, really incredibly quickly, a disease attacked our tree and it started to rot from the inside. And within just a matter of a year, that tree went from a full, healthy tree with lots of leaves and casting perfect shade over our house to something very different. It hardly even reflected the tree that it used to be. No longer had leaves on it, even in the middle of summer. Its branches were brittle and were constantly breaking off and falling to the ground. It didn't provide any shade at all to our front room, our 
room is now very hot in the summertime. It was hardly a reflection of the tree that it once was, but it was still a maple tree. It didn't cease to be a maple tree. That's what God made it, and that's what it is. And in the same way, no matter how depraved humanity is, and it is radically depraved, humanity as a whole has become a rotten group of rebels. That's how the Bible describes us, apart from the grace of Christ. But no matter how poorly we might reflect the glory of God, it doesn't change the fact that every human being continues to be an image bearer of the living God. We continue to be unique, uh, uniquely formed and uniquely fashioned among all creatures to represent him. The implications of that doctrine are uh, obvious and, and vast if you think about it. No matter how far we are from our original image and uh, design, we continue to be the unique image bearers of God. And therefore, no matter who we are and no matter who the other people we're thinking of are, nobody ever ceases to have the dignity and the honor that belongs to an image bearer. That's not to deny the reality of depravity, but we must uphold the inherent dignity that belongs to all men and all women, all children, all babies, because every human being is a, a, an image bearer of God created in his likeness. And that helps us understand more fully the wickedness of things like abortion and murder and abuse and racism and slander and any other sin that treats other human beings as something less than the dignity of an image bearer. And so even though the image of God has been radically distorted, it hasn't been lost. And it's important to remember also that the purpose of redemption is to restore us to that image. We've lost the image. Colossians 1 says Christ is the image of God. He is the perfect image of God. Romans 8 says that the goal of our redemption is to ultimately conform us to the image of Christ, who is the image of God. And so what is the aim of your redemption? Not just your forgiveness, not just the pardon of your sin, but the aim of your salvation is to make you fully what you were created to be as an image of God, more specifically to be like God's own son, Jesus Christ. He is the true image bearer, and our redemption has to do with us being restored to his image. Letter D, created, so we're still on the creation of man, Man was created with a conscience. I think I'll jump over this one for the sake of time. Uh, there's, a, there's a verse there that you can look up, Romans 2, 14 to 15. We've all been given a conscience. We all know what is right or wrong. That conscience has been affected by sin, but not abolished. And so all of us as human beings, we continue to have some bearing uh, with regard to what is right and what is wrong. And so we are all without excuse when it comes to sin. And then the third Sorry, the final point there under the second paragraph, created with the ability to obey. Uh, again, I think I'm going to skip over that one too. So we'll, uh, we'll come back to this point later on, especially when we get to the chapter in the confession about sin. Uh, but suffice it to say, Adam and Eve had the ability to sin, and they had the ability not to sin. That's all I'll say because I don't want to go down a rabbit trail. Obviously, we know they chose to sin, and we'll get there in a few weeks. So then thirdly, the command in the garden. The command in the garden, the third paragraph reads, Besides the law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. While they kept this command, they were happy in their communion or fellowship with God and had dominion over all the creatures. So paragraph two was talking about the moral law of God that was planted in their hearts. So it says in paragraph 2, they, they had the law of God written in their hearts, and that's a reference to Romans 2, which we didn't look at. But everyone has the law of God written in their hearts. Adam and Eve had the law of God, the moral law of God, written on their hearts so that they inherently knew perfectly at that point in time what was right and what was wrong. But there was an additional law given that wasn't part of the natural law or part of the moral law. And so the point is, Adam and Eve would have never known not to eat of the tree of knowledge and evil if God had not revealed that commandment to them. It's not part of the natural or moral law. And, and it, the, the purpose of the confession pointing that out is to show that this was, a, in a lot of ways, a probationary type of command. It was, 
It was meant to expose whether Adam and Eve were really willing to submit themselves to the authority of God. Would they submit themselves to a command that God gave them that wasn't part of natural or moral revelation, but was part of God's spoken verbal revelation, external to the law that was written on their hearts? Would they choose to obey a command that God gave them with regard to a specific tree in the garden? That was the nature of the command. It was, do not eat. It might seem arbitrary. Why would God command them not to eat of a particular fruit in the garden? The question is not, why would God command it? The question is, what does it mean to disobey it? And to disobey even what seems like an arbitrary command, it's not entirely arbitrary, but even if it were, the reality is to obey even an arbitrary command is an expression of such rebellion that it merits the very consequences that Adam and Eve experienced for their sin. And so they had the choice in the garden of either obeying or disobeying the external law given to them, one that wasn't written initially in their heart. The result of that obedience would be continued communion and dominion with God. They would enjoy continued unhindered fellowship with the living God, and they would continue to exercise their calling as human beings to rule over and govern creation. The garden in this original condition was paradise. It was perfect. It is what you and I were created for to be in perfect, unhindered, full relationship and communion with the living God. Jesus says in John 17 that eternal life is to know God, not just know him intellectually, but relationally to be in fellowship with the living God and to know him. That's eternal life. And so the garden was perfect fullness of life, communion with the living God. And it was uh, life without the uh, curse and the effects of the curse, man exercising perfect and full dominion, over creation. It was paradise, but it was a mutable paradise. It was a a paradise that could change and could be lost. And as we know, it did change because of sin, and it was lost because of sin. As believers, we are looking for, the whole story of the Bible is the fact that we are looking for a better paradise, a better garden. And that's really the storyline of the Bible. The initial setting of Adam and Eve is paradise, but a paradise that could be lost. The storyline of the Bible is paradise lost, and yet paradise, uh, an even greater paradise, restored. It's a greater paradise because it's a paradise that could never be lost. It's the experience of God's presence and his unhindered fellowship that could never be diminished or taken away from us because it is accomplished and secured eternally by the better Adam. And so Jesus has secured for us an eternal paradise in the garden of the new heavens and the new earth, which is described in the book of Revelation as the temple, the holy dwelling place of God. And so we are looking forward to a garden, a paradise that is far greater than the garden or the paradise that Adam and Eve originally existed in. That garden is only a pale comparison of the eternally blessed communion that you and I will share because of Jesus Christ. And so it is then, I think as we've read through this this chapter on creation, I think it is appropriate for us to pull back for a moment and ask the question, do we worship God as creator? Do we take time to pull back, reflect on the reality of God as our maker, and do we express to him heartfelt worship, knowing that we owe all of our existence to him, that all things come from him and exist for him? The epitome of rebellion in the human heart is the denial of God as creator. The rebellion of the human heart says, I do not want God as my creator. I would rather be my own authority. And that is what sin is, and that is what Jesus has come to redeem us from. The life of redemption says, I want God as my maker. I want him as my creator. And I want to live my life in glad submission to him and worship him as my God. So may God help us then to be people who worship him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as God the Creator. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you that you and your eternal wisdom and goodness and power have chosen to display your glory through the things that you've made. And we thank you that we are a part of that. We thank you that you have determined to make us and to fashion us in your image and to place us on this earth in order to reflect your glory. 
And Father, we thank you that though we have radically distorted the image that we were created to bear, we thank you that through Christ Jesus, the perfect image, you have now given us all the grace we need for that image to be restored again. You've created us in righteousness and holiness and truth through Christ. So we pray, God, to help us to be eager to reflect you in the ways that we were designed to do. And we pray that you would enable us to do that by the grace that's given to us through Jesus alone. We pray in his name. Amen.